welcome to The Conversation. My name is Lisa and I'll be your host in today's show. We also have Jared, our resident astronomer, <laughs> and we have Space Mike, our rocket specialist. And we also have a daughter producing this show. Now, today in space news, we have... A satellite that was long thought dead has returned from the grave. And the space station's new faulty hand has been fixed and cosmonauts also go on a record-breaking spacewalk. And we also have an interview with Gilmore Space Technologies. Stay tuned. This is tomorrow, Orbit 11.05. Good morning. Escape Velocity Citizens of Tomorrow that help crowdfund these shows. These are the people that give us $10 per episode on Patreon or $30 per month on Minds.com. They get access to our exclusive behind-the-scenes Discord channel and a host of all other really cool rewards. So if you would like to help and crowdfund the shows of tomorrow as well, head on over to Patreon.com or mine, uh, Makersupport.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, we always like to start off this show with some launches. So, Space Mike, what did we miss in the last week? Before, what happened? Before we get started on the launches from the last week, uh, in case you guys are wondering, uh, unfortunately, Carrie Ann is sick this week, so Lisa was kind enough to uh, um, step in and host for us this week. Thank you very much, Lisa, for being here. Um, and so this week, we want to talk about quite a few things that are going on at SpaceX. And this past week, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket that launched a military-grade communications satellite for SES and the Luxembourg government. And uh, this launch happened uh, j this past week on uh, January 31st at 2125 Coordinated Universal Time from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. Love that. Just so happens that this rocket was lifting off from Cape Canaveral on the 60th anniversary of the launch of Explorer 1, the first United States satellite. And the Falcon 9 launched a day after SpaceX had scrubbed a countdown to replace a faulty sensor on the Falcon 9's second stage. Pretty lucky coincidence, I think, anyway. <laughs> the yeah. rocket's first stage booster, which was reused from a launch uh, back in May of 2017, shut down and detached from the upper stage and uh, went back for a descent into the Atlantic Ocean as planned. However, even though the first stage booster was outfitted with grid fins and landing legs, there was no drone ship deployed for the booster to land on. This was because SpaceX was testing the effectiveness of a high thrust landing burn using three of its engines instead of just one. Now, meanwhile, the upper stage, uh, single engine Merlin upper stage, uh, shut down around eight and a half minutes and then reignited its engine about 18 minutes into flight uh, to uh, place the, the, the satellite, which is called GovSat-1, into an elliptical high altitude super synchronous transfer orbit that stretches about 36,000 miles or 58,000 kilometers above Earth at its highest point. And then the satellite itself, using its own propulsion, is going to be uh, synchronizing into its final geostationary orbit. Now, uh, owned by Luxembourg, GovSat is a, a public-private joint venture between SES and the government of Luxembourg, and it's going to offer secure military communication services for Luxembourg, as well as the country's allies in Europe and NATO. Now, apparently, the first stage uh, landing test did go well, and the booster did survive <laughs> its water landing and was photographed there. It's and Elon part. Musk even wrote on Twitter. That's so cool. Oh, boy. Have Elon I... Musk wrote on Twitter. 
<laughs> that uh, hopefully the recovery team will be able to tow this first stage back to the port. And uh, I'm curious <laughs> to see what kind of damage was done for to this. But yeah, that's really cool that that test was uh, successful and, and they were able to find it again. So I just love that like and they weren't supposed to recover it, and you know it was just supposed to crash in the ocean and sink to the bottom like every other rocket in history besides Falcon 9 <laughs> and the shuttle. But this one survived. Like I think that's incredible. Um, <laughs> but Mike, there were some more launches, right? Yes, there were. There were quite a few more launches. Next, we had a Soyuz launch that was carrying 11 Russian, German, and U.S. satellites into orbit. And this was on Thursday, February 1st, from the Vostochny Cosmodrome. And it launched at 2.07 Coordinated Universal Time. This Soyuz 2-1A rocket was fitted with a Fregat upper stage, which was programmed to fire seven times to deploy its 11 satellites into two distinct orbits that were several hundred miles in altitude, and then break, uh, do a firing burn to break and uh, be able to have a destructive re-entry back into Earth's atmosphere, ensuring that it doesn't create any space junk. Now, the primary payloads on this flight were the Canopus V numbers three and four Earth observation satellites. The two spacecraft, which each weigh about a half a ton, will assist the Russian government in disaster response, mapping, forest fire detection, and resource monitoring. But aside from those two primary payloads, there was also four LEMUR-2 CubeSats that were uh, for the United States Space Spire Global's commercial space network that uh, they're going to have hopefully have a commercial uh, uh, communications network with these small CubeSats. And uh, aside from that, there was also four nano satellites for a technical university of Ber Berlin, which are demonstrating S-band inter-satellite communication packages that would allow future constellations of spacecraft to conduct autonomous missions. And there was also a CubeSat for a amateur radio relay uh, called D-Star-1 Phoenix that was developed by German Orbital Systems. And it's interesting because it replaces the D-Star-1 nanosatellite that was launched on a similar uh, flight on the Soyuz that uh, had an error from, uh, back in November of 28th of last year, which also lost from launched from Vostochny, but unfortunately the payloads were not placed into the correct orbit and quickly fell back to Earth. So it was cool to see that this launch was uh, successful and that those two uh, satellites and the secondary payloads were deployed successfully. So congratulations to Roscosmos for that. Yeah, that's awesome. But there was even more launches, right, Mike? <laughs> Yes, there was. And uh, uh, seeming to be uh, a little bit of an irritation to some people, we had another Chinese launch that happened this week that we need to talk about. But this one had a couple of commercial uh, uh, payloads on board, so we got a little bit more media and information from this one. I'm talking about a, a Long March 2D launch that launched uh, seven satellites into orbit, uh, including two for uh, some uh, Al Argentina companies and then uh, two others that were for... Um, uh, a company that is out of Denmark. We'll get to that in just a minute. So let's go ahead and check out the footage of this, and uh, you'll, 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 you'll see what I mean in just a moment here. Uh, the primary payload was Zhang Heng 1, which is designed to measure se seismic signals that could help predict future earthquakes. Now, this Long March 2D launched on Friday, February 2nd at 7.51 Coordinating Universal Time from the GCON Satellite Space Center. And the primary payload is also called the China Seismo Electromagnetic Satellite, which was developed in partnership with the, um, some Italian scientists. Now, there were six other uh, payloads, and two of them were cubes, CubeSats for a company called GOMSpace from the, uh, a company that's in Denmark that I mentioned. But there was also uh, two others called NewSat4 and NewSat5, which are hyperspectral images imaging microsatellites owned by Satellogic, the uh, Argentine company. And then there was also two CubeSats named FMN1 and Xiaonian Zing, which were also launched uh, for Chinese startup companies on this particular launch. So uh, very cool to see another launch. And uh, we're going to hopefully have a competition going on between SpaceX and China to see who, who <laughs> launches more rockets this year. And I'm excited <laughs> to see who wins. But there was also one other launch. 
Oh, yeah, I was going to say, should we, should we count it as rockets or cores that get launched throughout the year? Mm, good question. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I think we should just count it as total rockets. We'll, we'll see. Sounds good. So. Mm. <laughs> but uh, we had a, uh, of course, we're all looking forward to the Falcon Heavy launch, which hopefully will occur this upcoming week. It's uh, been scheduled for February 6th, but, you know, of course, rocketry is hard, and we'll see if it actually goes off on the first scheduled time. Uh, but even though the Falcon Heavy is a very, very large rocket that's debuting, there's another rocket that has debuted that uh, has attempted to launch before, but this is a much, 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 much smaller rocket. In <laughs> fact, it's an upgraded sounding rocket to be able to launch a three-unit CubeSat into orbit. And uh, this was done by JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace uh, Agency. And... Oh, there wasn't a whole, well, you'll see. There was a, this happened um, earlier today, actually, uh, Saturday, February 3rd, at 5.03 Coordinated Universal Time from the Uchinura Space Center, which is on uh, Japan's uh, southern Kyushu Island. And uh, this is pretty exciting. Each. This rocket is the SS-520-5, which is a three-stage solid-fueled rocket, and it's shot, of course, you might have seen that it's shot from a rail launcher there, and JAXA confirmed that the rocket successfully achieved orbit less than four and a half minutes after liftoff, one of the <laughs> fastest space shots ever carried out. <laughs> Oh. But not only that, uh, this launch uh, uh, carried a three-unit CubeSat, uh, which was called TRICOM-1R. And the whole idea behind this is that the whole reason that they're doing this is to get the price down for launching a single three-unit CubeSat to, into orbit for less than $500,000. So uh, I think that this is a pretty interesting project. And confirmation that the SS520-5 successfully reached orbit was provided by the, uh, JAXA about three hours after liftoff. And from the footage that you saw there, all we really saw was the first stage burning and didn't see much uh, footage after that. So it wasn't known right away whether or not this launch was successful. However, um, after their report, it was also confirmed by the U.S. Joint uh, Space Operations Center that they showed the SS-520 exceeding its orbital expectations and that the rocket and the TRICOM-1R CubeSat were in a slightly higher orbit uh, plan than the 200-kilometer orbit that they had, they had reached there. So... Uh, uh, not only was this successful, it did better than initially planned. And the last time that we saw this rocket attempt to, to launch uh, was from the uh, SS520-4 launch, which occurred last year on January 15th, 2017, and the second stage failed mid-flight. So this is very exciting that they were able to pull this off and that the information has been confirmed that they were successfully able to place the upper stage and the, the CubeSat into orbit. So I really like to see uh, on both sides of the scales of rocket of having these really small nano satellite launchers and then the really big uh, launcher that hopefully will be uh, debuting this week as well. So congratulations to all the people at JAXA who've uh, made this project happen. I just love how it kind of just it rockets off the pad and the destructor in the chat room, he said, uh, and gone, just gone. Because it just, <laughs> and gone. It just exploded <laughs> off that pad. That was crazy. Oh, those, that's solid yeah. motors for you. They're, yeah. they're pretty potent. So. Oh, man. Thanks, Mike. Um, <laughs> Jared, tell me about something that we lost that we now found again. Yeah, it's always nice to have something come back to you, you know, especially if you lose it a really long time ago. Um, and it's sort of the big surprise that's happened in the space science world this week, uh, which is that a dead NASA mission is back, like some kind of orbital Lazarus coming back to us. Um, and this mission is called the Imager for Magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration Mission, and it's also known as IMAGE. It's a um, yes, a little bit. So I will call it IMAGE from here on out. Um, it was launched from Vandenberg Air Force base on March 25th in the year 2000, um, and it operated until December 2005 when they lost communication, and they expected a potential reboot to occur sometime in December of 2007. 
but it ended up yielding nothing as well, and the mission was officially declared dead and over. But lo and behold, last week, on January 24th, Scott Tilley, an amateur radio astronomer in British Columbia, happened upon a happy accident while observing the sky. He was actually hunting for signals from a potential payload that we've <laughs> talked way too much about. <laughs> um, and he ended up finding an unexpected signal. And he contacted NASA very quickly, who locked on it and found that the ID code on that signal is 166, which is the same as image's code. Now, uh, the expected peak of signal and the oscillations from image rotating were present as well. And then this week on January 30th, the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab had a go, and they were receiving telemetry from image. Now, NASA has said they're going to continue to work to make sure that the signals are actually from image itself, uh, which would make it officially official that it's not quite dead yet. Uh, but don't get your hopes up too far. The hardware and software for image is old enough that it's likely not around anymore. Um, but that's not going to stop the engineers from attempting to what would be the next step after official confirmation that image is back, which is attempting to turn the science package on and then receiving useful data from it. Because image was was, after all, a science mission. It was sent up to study the magnetosphere uh, and its interaction with high energy particles that lead to auroras. Now, its legacy was carried on by the magnetospheric multi scale mission, which is four spacecraft flying in formation to gather data. Now, if IMAGE is able to return scientific data, it will allow observations between the two missions in detail that we could only dream about. So, that is, uh, that is really exciting. Then it just suddenly turned right back on, and it's like, hey, I'm here. What are you guys up to? What have you been up to? And we don't, we actually, um, they actually went back in what we call pre covery, where they looked at uh, data from before, um, and it was, image was actually broadcasting as early as October of 2016. Oh, wow. So it's only just now that huh. somebody actually noticed. Just because uh, we happened to was. be looking at that particular area. Because mm -hmm. they were trying to find <laughs> uh, with it, so yeah. I, I love that, you know, it's amateurs you know, getting out there that, you know, helped to, to kind of find it and bring that back to life. What were yeah. you going to say, Space Mike? I also kind of love how this follows the law of the universe, that we didn't find it and reestablish contact with this thing until we'd already sent up all of the replacement satellites to uh, yeah. re replace this scientific mission. So you don't find what you've lost until you buy a replacement for it. That's, yeah. Isn't that the rule of the universe? <laughs> <I think laughs> Something so. like that. And uh, speaking of replacing things, Space Mike, what's happening on the station? Yeah, there was a, so if you remember last week, we talked about a faulty hand at the space station, which is the latch end effector that is at the end of the Canada arm. And there was a planned spacewalk that Mark Van de Heij and Nora Shiget Kanai were going to conduct this past Monday to replace that latch end effector. And that was canceled due to a software patch over this past weekend that got the new hand working properly. So Van de Heij and Kanai are going to go on another spacewalk on February 15th to bring the old hand that they were going to swap out uh, back back inside the station to uh, for an eventual return inside SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Meanwhile, the people you see on screen are Russian cosmonauts Alexander Mysurkin and Anton Skaplarov, who floated outside the International Space Station on Friday and installed an upgraded electronics box for one of the high-gain communications antennas at the aft end of the Zvezda service module. Now, the spacewalk was expected to last a little over six hours, but the work took a little bit longer than expected, and Mysurkin and Skaplarov finally returned into the Piers airlock and closed the hatch at a duration of 8 hours and 13 minutes, which officially made Friday's spacewalk the longest in history for Russia's space program and the fifth longest spacewalk ever. So uh, that was kind of a, a uh, happy little accident that they had after all that hard work. Now, what they were doing, the electronics box that, that they replaced is used on the critical Lyra high-gain antenna that's used to transmit data between the station's Russian segment and Russian ground controllers near Moscow. And the cosmonauts, after they were able to replace it and untangle all of the different uh, latches for it and all of the different uh, wires and connections, they tossed the old Lyra electronics box overboard, so to speak, uh, where it's going <laughs> to be expected to burn up in the atmosphere in a couple of months. Now, after replacing the Lyra electronics box, and there he is uh, tossing it over to the side right there. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, the ground space control junk. 
<laughs> for, for a little while, for a little while anyway. <laughs> nice. Now, uh, after they replaced the new box, ground controllers actually had trouble rotating the antenna because the, the new box was getting snagged on old radar equipment. So that's what took so long. The cosmonauts had, trouble, had to troubleshoot and move around a lot of different wires and hardware to accommodate the new electronics box so that the antenna could rotate freely. So uh, that was a successful spacewalk there, and uh, I'm glad that the uh, latch end defector for the Canada arm was... Uh, able to get fixed with a uh, software patch and that things should be able to continue moving forward and the schedule for this year for the international space station is going to get really exciting near the end of this year so all these little things right now are preparing for that so we'll talk about that at a future date yeah i mean i love that they still got to go outside and do that spacewalk even though the the canada arm was fixed it was still cool they got to go outside and we got all that cool footage like that footage was amazing and, we, and there was so much of it which is Really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but Jared, yes. tell me a little bit about some burps in space. Yeah, there, occasionally there are burps in space, not just from astronauts, but from actual objects uh, that are out in space. And these burps are related to black holes. And what's what's in, what's very cool about this is that when we look at large galaxies and even some low mass galaxies, we often find a supermassive black hole at their core. And this is a black hole with a, with a mass that is millions, if not billions of times that of our own sun. Um, and they have an appetite for destruction, but that depends on what's around them. Um, and they tend to also throw what they're feeding on around a bit um, as well. So a team led by researchers from the University of Colorado Boulder presented at the 231st meeting of the American Astronomical Society. And by the way, that's a yearly meeting. So yes, this was the 231st year that the American Astronomical Society has met. Um, and they saw a supermassive black hole in a galaxy called SDSS J1354 plus one. 1327, <laughs> doing the cosmic equivalent of a messy midnight run to the fridge. Now, there were two separate outflow events that were observed, and these are events where material comes close to the black hole. Some of it falls into the black hole, um, but some of it also gets flung out because it doesn't pass the event horizon and it's moving fast enough that it can overcome that gravitational pull because uh, it hasn't crossed that point of no return. Um, so they found one that occurred quite a while ago and was sort of dissipating out into space. And then they found another one showing that there was recent activity. So we had two burps, if you will, that came from this black hole. Now they used additional observation from the Chandra X-ray telescope, Hubble, Space Telescope and the Keck Telescope in Hawaii, and they found that a very large cone of material was extending about 30,000 light years from the bulge of the galaxy. Now, because the gas is ionized, it's really energetic, we can determine that it encountered the black hole about 100,000 years ago. And then coming from the north of the black hole was a shock wave of gas. And that was only about 3,000 light years away from it. So, and a companion galaxy close to J1354 uh, likely interacted during the past. So what, what happened is that some, as the galaxies sort of went past each other, uh, some gas from the companion galaxy likely was sent on a plunge of doom to be the black hole snack. Now, this actually isn't a unique structure in our universe. Um, our own Milky Way galaxy has the leftovers of a snack from our own supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, uh, and it had it quite a long time ago. And these two bubbles of gas extend above and below the plane of the Milky Way, and that indicates that Sagittarius A star likely had its snack uh, about 7.5 million years ago. Now, both our own supermassive black hole in the Milky Way and the supermassive black hole in J354 are what the uh, astrophysicist Dr. Julie Comerford calls in, currently in a galactic food coma, where both of them are inactive because there's basically no material around them to fall in. But, you know, we monitor um, uh, especially Sagittarius A star, our supermassive black hole in the Milky Way. And we, uh, we have a very good lock on it, and we, we look at it all the time in order to see if there's any flare-ups or things that fall in um, to that black hole. And we're just keeping a very close eye on it because when we do that, we learn a lot more. And it uh, turns out black holes very far away across the universe work almost exactly like the black holes that we have here in our own Milky Way. So uh, there you go, more proof that physics works exactly the same throughout the universe. It's so. always good to be getting more and more data. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, yeah. never enough data. Never, ever. So. Mm -mm. All right, that's all the news that we have for you today. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be interviewing Gilmore Space Technology. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes She won't give up a quick or from a little fashion lies Filled with awesome expectations 
And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into our interview today, I want to give a huge shout out to all of the citizens of Tomorrow to help make this show possible. So we've got our Escape Velocity citizens. These are the people that give us uh, $10 per episode or $30 per month on Minds.com. And we also have our Orbital subscribers. These are the people that give us... Uh, they give us... Uh, how much do they give us? A lot. A lot. They give us $5 per episode on Patreon or they give us $15 per month on makersupport.com. And if you'd like to go help out the shows of tomorrow as well, you can head over to pa uh, patreon.com or makersupport.com slash T-M-R-O. Cool, so today we have James from Gilmore Space Technologies with us. And James, thank you so much for coming and being on the show today for us. Yeah, and uh, hi everyone. Cool, so I think to start off, the first thing that uh, our viewers might want to be aware of is um, I don't think a lot of people might have heard of Gilmore Space Technologies because you're actually an Australian company, right? Yes, so we're based uh, in the land down under. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Gilmore Space Technologies is a relatively new space engineering company. Uh, my brother and I started this uh, venture in 2012. And uh, we're based in uh, Queensland, Australia, and we're uh, developing and building a new uh, breed of low-cost hybrid rocket uh, um, uh, launch vehicles. That's awesome. Um, so the vehicles that you're going to be launching, um, what kind of market are you trying to aim to fill there? So, look, we're looking to have uh, two, I guess, uh, commercial uh, products. Uh, one is a sounding rocket. Um, uh, 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 please, if your uh, viewers wish, jump online. You'd see our uh, first rocket that we launched uh, successfully in uh, in 2006. Is that the Rasta um, rocket? We did that with yeah, with the the, the Rasta rocket. Yeah, so we got that a video was, of that. Um, I think. Um, yeah, it, uh, this one here, I think, is our. Yeah, uh, so you're just uh, you're just seeing that uh, uh, now. So that was uh, launched on the 22nd of July, uh, in 2016, to a small altitude. Uh, essentially, that was a technology uh, demonstrator uh, in an attempt for us to look at uh, some venture capital support. Uh, we did that with a small team of uh, of just three headcount. Uh, today we've got a staff of about uh, uh, 30, uh, comprising majority of, uh, of engineers, um, and we also have operations uh, uh, based in Singapore. But to get back to your uh, question, Lisa, uh, so our first kind of commercial uh, um, uh, product will be a sounding rocket, and uh, some other footage you might have is of the motor that we just tested in the 22nd of December last year. So that was uh, quite a significant uh, achievement for our, our company. Uh, we achieved uh, 45 kilonewtons of, uh, of, of thrust. And uh, I was hoping to have some more footage for you guys, but uh, we've delayed our, our test and we're looking at Wednesday uh, of this week to perform a high pressure test that we expect to uh, see about 70 kilonewtons of thrust. And essentially, that will be our, our motor for our sound, sounding rocket. And then uh, after that, we're looking to develop a, a small launch vehicle to low Earth orbit. And uh, our mantra, well, uh, uh, part of our reason is to design for cost and look at providing the cheapest uh, orbital and insertion vehicle around. So the two programs that you have, you have the, I believe it's called the aerial rocket, that's the sounding rocket, and then the orbital rocket. That's the sounding rocket. The, that's the ARIS program, is that right? Yes, that's right. Awesome. Uh, why those names? Why did you pick those? 
Uh, well, look, I mean, uh, those were just names uh, uh, based from uh, a, a Greek Greek goddess, um, and we just thought that that was a, a nice name that was going to respond favourably to the marketplace. However, uh, that is uh, also subject to change, and we might be looking to put out a uh, a bit of a competition uh, with regards to engagement of uh, STEM in uh, in Australia to look at uh, some of the naming rights for those uh, for those future uh, launch vehicles. So, something to keep an eye out for. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. Uh, hopefully, I can get involved in that too. You know, uh, being Australian myself. Um, I actually, hope so. You guys actually do a lot of outreach, don't you? Um, you had a um, STEM outreach program for school kids. Is that right? Yeah, so to take you and your listeners a, a step back, uh, I guess why we looked at uh, a, a space or space technology, my brother and I, uh, it, it started with Bert Rattan and, and Scale Composites uh, after them winning the Lunar X Prize. We saw that as uh, a bit of a shift in, in, in the market and uh, we're, we're calling that a space renaissance, spurred on by a number of people that you and your uh, constituents are, are well aware of. You know, um, James Cameron, Bob Bigelow, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, uh, who were all successful businessmen in their own right, uh, who were putting uh, vast sums of money into uh, uh, space space technology. And uh, we always wanted to build rockets, but we knew it was going to be a very expensive uh, exercise. And we thought that we could uh, generate some uh, revenue uh, with a, a space camp. So my brother and I, I think it was in 2010, went to uh, Huntsville, Alabama and performed in the adult uh, uh, space camp. And while that was great, we thought that we could uh, um, uh, do a better job. And so started what was the initiative called Space Flight Academy. And essentially that was astronaut training as real as it gets. It was uh, really for anybody that was 9 to 99, we had high fidelity uh, uh, mock-ups and, and simulators. We had a six degree of freedom uh, our motion simulator platform onto a, uh, a reusable launch vehicle, which was um, a pretty cool and one of its kind, particularly in Australia. A two degree of freedom uh, uh, full size uh, a, a capsule. Um, yeah, and a whole bunch of other uh, uh, multi access trainers, wall climbs, and stuff. And we did that for about uh, uh, nine months. Uh, mainly with uh, um, schools and whatnot from the local catchment, but we also saw their uh, travel uh, uh, domestically from Melbourne, Sydney and even Perth, which was good. But um, that helped with some of our exposure uh, uh, within the market and uh, upon them receiving $5 million in venture capital to uh, uh, support the uh, our rockets, we have uh, uh, put that on hold. So as well as giving you exposure and um, leading to you guys getting investment, one thing I don't think people realised about your Spaceflight Academy is that you didn't just buy all of those simulation uh, equipment and simulators, you actually built them, right? Yes. Yeah, so, um one problem we encountered uh, early on was that it was very hard to find uh, anybody that had the capability um, to uh, uh, build some of our replicas and our lockups. So we originally started the, uh, uh, the company uh, with the intent to uh, design and build and fabricate all the uh, high fidelity replicas and, uh, and mockups. So pretty cool, but. A real shame for, for me because they are sitting uh, are sitting in our workshop gathering uh, dust while we're looking at brokering uh, local governments in order to see Spaceflight Academy come back to uh, fruition. Well, I mean, I hope it comes back as well because I'd actually like to go and try out the simulators for myself, but we'll see what <laughs> happens. Um, let's go back to um, the rockets that you guys are building. Uh, what kind of technology is going to set apart the rockets that you're making um, compared to um, the other rockets that we're starting to see come online? Sure. So uh, unlike most other rocket companies which uh, use liquid rocket engines, uh, they bring a lot of complexity and um, 
well, what I think is a lot of problems attributed to uh, uh, rocket propulsion. Ours is a hybrid rocket, and uh, which is much uh, simpler, less complex, and uh, less explosive, and uh, very much a, a, a green motor. So for some of your um, uh, constituents who probably don't know what a hybrid rocket is, but they probably do, uh, it's a mix of both a liquid and a, a solid. And uh, we've uh, demonstrated uh, over 20 uh, test fires from uh, diameters of uh, 7 centimetre, 9 centimetre, 15 centimetre, and just recently a 46 centimetre uh, hybrid rocket motor. And the 46 centimetre um, hybrid uh, rocket motor test firing that you were doing, is that the one that you just test fired uh, a month or two ago? Yeah, so our first test was uh, on the 22nd of uh, December. So that is going to be the backbone for the Sounding Rocket uh, campaign. That's awesome. I think we've got some footage here that we're going to show. Um, so can you talk about uh, yeah, what's so, happening in this uh, footage? The... Yeah, sure. Test and verification of our BEM uh, ballistic evaluation uh, motor. So that was a 15 centimeter uh, configuration. The one there is, uh, the one in the screen now is the test of the 46 centimeter motor. So this is uh, from a hybrid uh, uh, a rocket and that white uh, uh, part that you see there is actually the solid uh, uh, combustion chamber that we use 3D printing to uh, reduce and overcome some of the legacy issues uh, associated with hybrid rockets uh, in the past. So are you 3D printing the engine itself or are you 3D printing the engine and the fuel? Because you guys can 3D print fuel as well, right? Well, look, we, uh, you know, could I could 3D print all of it, but um, we're, I think uh, we're still a long uh, way away from that. So essentially 3D printing takes its place in the full fuel component of the um, uh, of the motor. And it's just, it, it's still quite a, a long and laborious um, a, a process, but it's overcome some of the issues associated with hybrid rockets, uh, such as slumping. So we're really excited and uh, we're, we, we think that we've got uh, what it takes to be a real motion game. Cool. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you guys about was uh, when do you foresee this program coming online? Like especially the, the orbital uh, campaign that, that you'll be pursuing. What's your kind of timeline for all of this? Well, uh, 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 timelines in rocketry, as Mike already knows, is uh, very speculatory <laughs> in nature. Uh, there are a number and a myriad of uh, complex, uh, both internal and external factors that uh, af affect it. And look, I mean, subject to uh, regulatory approval, that uh, large motor that you saw tested, we're hoping to um, uh, launch that uh, mid uh, this year, and that will be uh, to an altitude of, of about 70 k's. Um, it does have the ability to go higher, but uh, in Australia, uh, we have some onerous and draconious uh, rules associated with um, uh, with rockets, and once you go over 100 k's, you uh, trigger a lot of red tape and a lot of um, in insurance that I don't think is fit, fit uh, for purpose, so we're looking to fly under the radar, so to speak, and uh, we're also in the process of uh, securing a, uh, a launch range, and with that in mind, uh, we'd like to start commercialising sounding rockets uh, by 2019. We've already got some uh, indicative uh, letters of uh, uh, support and intent, so essentially we're not like the might see we're going to show and prove ourselves and once we verify our technology that's going to give us our, our confidence for us to move forward and, and engage with the uh, our customers that we've uh, been speaking with. So you're flying under the radar for now but in the future do you think uh, you might have plans to 
work with or get support from the Australian Space Agency? Because uh, we have a question from the chat room uh, from Astro YYZ who is asking, will you work with the new Australian Space Agency, the one that got announced uh, in September of 2017 at the IAC conference in, in Adelaide? Oh, look, good question, without a doubt. Uh, I, I'm also a big advocate and I've been lobbying uh, the government and the community uh, for an Australian Space Agency agency for quite some time. Uh, I was part of, uh, I, I'm an advisor to the Space Industry Association of Australia, of uh, drafting some of the law papers uh, for cabinet uh, submission. And uh, yeah, look, I mean, uh, just to give your, your guys an update on that, the uh, Arthur Senadinas um, announced a review of Australian space capability and there was a, a expert review a group that went around the uh, country engaging with uh, and industry and government looking at Australian space capability and they uh, uh, have earmarked a report from those findings in March uh, this year, which is quite exciting. And look, uh, um, uh, uh, the establishment of an agency like that will take some time and uh, we're looking to shore uh, uh, ensure that there um, is a favourable landscape for companies like mine who um, who are looking to create an indigenous launch uh, uh, capability and also support some of the great and innovative uh, startup uh, and, and getting established satellite manufacturing uh, uh, companies in uh, particularly in Adelaide who you very much know about, Lisa. Yeah, and I think here at Tomorrow we kind of have an all ships ride with the tide mentality that, you know, the, the more uh, of a friendly ecosystem we have for space all around the world, um, it kind of helps everyone. So it's looking up for Australia to kind of finally get in the space game and that's going to that's gonna have effects around the world, I think, especially if we can get, oh. you know, small sat launches going as well. Oh, look, 100%. Uh, I've got a philosophy that uh, is deep. Um, with me and that is if you want to go fast go by yourself but if you want to go far go together and uh, look it might be a bit easier if uh, we were to move and you know maybe start up in a, another country that's favorable favorable to a launch uh, uh, provider but we're not I was born in Australia and uh, I'm going to do whatever I can to ensure that uh, we can provide an indigenous uh, uh, launch capability and I think that the, the biggest hurdle that we have to uh, uh, overcome as a space community is the education around uh, uh, some of the stuff that is happening and has the potential to happen uh, uh, both uh, domestically and abroad. And I think that's a major uh, um, uh, element. Um, are you planning to launch from Australia too or will you be utilising um, worldwide launch facilities? Oh, well, look, I mean, we'll do we in Kennedy um, uh, two years ago, um, looking at uh, our launch uh, our options and whatnot. Uh, we had, there still might be an opportunity for us to launch from the Cape, which is quite exciting. They even, they even said that we could uh, assemble some of our componentry in the old VAB, which would just be, you know, amazing. Um, uh, but... You know, I, I think there are some synergies uh, uh, to be had, particularly with orbital insertion from uh, uh, from Australia, uh, both to the north of the country and to the south of the uh, uh, of, of the country. No, that's all good. Um, uh, so I might just finish off with uh, one last question, um, just about the kind of. Uh, price point that you see uh, your launch is coming at and how that might enable, um, you know, the small sat kind of revolution and help, help open, a open access to space for small satellites? Ah, the good old uh, price point discussion in, uh, in launch vehicles. Yeah, look, I mean, um, uh, uh, our mantra is to design for cost. Uh, if you look at our factors of production with regards to hybrid rockets, uh, they are traditionally... Uh, safer. Um, uh, we don't need a, a turbo pump or we don't need to cryogenically store our, our fuel. Uh, so that always helps when and you're what, trying to mitigate the uh, cost. Um, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Right, cool. So you can store that at, uh, at, at uh, 
uh, you need appropriate uh, PPE, which is personal uh, uh, protective uh, equipment and whatnot, but, uh, you know, it's not as uh, dangerous or as toxic as some uh, fuels in liquids or, or solids. Um, and, and speaking of uh, uh, price, uh, you, you know, there's been a lot of talk. If you want to talk about uh, the heavy end of the scale, uh, we're looking at about um, a twenty-three to thirty-eight thousand dollars per per kilogram uh, for a max payload of about four hundred uh, uh, kilograms, and uh, we think that uh, we can uh, uh, achieve uh, that because of some of, like I mentioned, factors of uh, production uh, with, uh, with 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 hybrid rockets. And the other thing I would like to mention is with some of our, uh, um, the other established uh, companies, they have huge headcount. Uh, you know, you're looking at uh, over 400, 500 uh, uh, people for a, um, a vehicle that hasn't even launched that. And that's, you know. The bandwidth in Australia is, uh, is something to be desired. So this connection is coming across an ocean um, fingers crossed we can get James back. And we've dropped out. And it's gone. It's gone. Okay. Well, I think what we might do is uh, we might uh, wrap that interview up there. And uh, what we're going to do is take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have our questions and comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into our questions and comments from last week's show, we'd love to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of the supporters of Tomorrow. These are our crowdfunding supporters, our Escape Velocity citizens, and these are the people that give us $10 per episode on Patreon or $30 per month on Maker Support. But we also have our Orbital citizens who contribute $5 per episode on Patreon or $15 per month on Maker Support. And we also have our Suborbital citizens who give us $2.50 per episode on Patreon or $5 per month on Maker Support. And they get their name in the show during the third segment, uh, exclusive access to Patreon-only Hangouts, and much, much more as well. So if you'd like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, you can head over to patreon.com or makeasupport.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, and before we do get into com comments and questions from last week's show, we also want to give a huge shout out to the First to the Moon Kickstarter campaign, which is the the little uh, promo that you just saw in that ad break there. Um, so mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be doing some great work, right, Jared? Yeah, I really, I really hope that they can make their Kickstarter um, because uh, Apollo 8 was uh, an incredible mission um, and came at a really tumultuous time in American history too. So it was, it was very important uh, uh, culturally in that time period. So it, it, I really hope that they make it on that. They've got so. a few more days left in their campaign, but they're not quite at their goal yet. So mm -hmm. if you have the um, the ability to, and only if you do have the ability, um, and you think it's a great thing that, that you'd like to support, uh, we recommend heading over to Kickstarter and looking up First to the Moon. Um, it's going to be a great movie, and uh, we wish them all the success in their crowdfunding campaign and uh, in the production of that movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so uh, our questions and comments from last week's show. Last week we talked about SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. That was Orbit 11.04. And our first comment today comes off of Reddit, and it is from Cap MSFC. And Cap MSFC says, the Ariane 5 launch anomaly is a way bigger deal
deal than you made it seem in the show. It was completely out of the flight corridor the whole time and flew over populated areas. The SRBs, uh, solid rocket boosters, and core stage were dropped way outside of their exclusion zones. This flight was a public hazard and should have been terminated as soon as it pitched over on the wrong trajectory. It's a dumb luck of compounding mistakes that the mission is only a partial failure with both sats able to make up for the inclination difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it was a really big, uh, a really big problem um, after it happened. Um, but I guess to kind of qualify this comment, this comment came four days after our show where we talked about it, which when we did our show, this was not a known thing at the moment. We didn't, we didn't actually know what the trajectory was of the Ariane 5. We didn't realize that it had crossed over overpopulated areas as it was doing that. So, um, so we legit did not know this. Um, and of course, you know, it's kind of tough to update a show when you've, when you've done it. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and think, to, to, to the idea too that it should have been uh, terminated as soon as they figured out that it was in the wrong trajectory, they didn't know that it was in the wrong trajectory until they reestablished contact with uh, the, the upper stage and satellites after the upper stage had already finished its its firing and the satellites had separated. So uh, to, to be honest, there wasn't really a way to even uh, uh, terminate the launch, which I agree, they probably should have done that, uh, having launching and, and separating parts of it overpopulated areas, but they didn't even have the capability to do so. So yes, this was very serious. And uh, one other thing that I think yeah, well, uh, NASA even is going to be involved with uh, the investigation of this mishap, especially considering that the James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to be launching on Ariane 5 soon. So uh, there's going to be a lot of serious work to figure out exactly what this problem was. And I still haven't gotten any updates, though, as to whether or not uh, the rest of the Ariane 5s, at least before James Webb, are going to continue launching as planned or if they're going to ground the fleet for a little while. What, yeah. what was your point, though, that you were going to say, Lisa? Well, the two problems I was going to say is, first of all, that they didn't know it was on the wrong trajectory. Like, how can you not know where your rocket is? Like, that, that to me, is crazy pants. Like, mm -hmm. and then the second one is that, like, even if they had have terminated it when it was flying over those people, if they had have broke it up, like, above people, then wouldn't the debris rain down on people like a, like a China launch? Like, isn't that dangerous as well? Yeah, so that's that's actually one of the things where they're they're kind of they're talking about too, um, not just necessarily with this, but also with um, that that claim um, made by the Air Force a couple weeks ago, which is that they're going to be able to do polar launches out of uh, Kennedy Space Center um, because that that has the rocket you know hug Florida and go over places like Bermuda and Cuba um, in order to do that. Um, so yeah, it is kind of one of those things where if it is over a populated area, um, that's a very tough decision to make as to whether you terminate the flight or not. Um, because if it's if it's flying nominally, like nominal atti or correct attitude, and it's just on the wrong path, you may not want to terminate it because the rocket may continue downrange. So then you can send it to a safe place to terminate it. But Terminating a rocket is really uh, a game time decision. That's a decision that you make not <laughs> not uh, not 60 seconds before um, you terminate it. You have to, it's sort of like a on the spot kind of determination with it. So, yeah, and yeah. Um, in our chat room, the Ethereum uh, said that they did know that the trajectory was wrong actually, um, and that they decided not to destroy the rocket because the debris would have fallen on the populated area. Yeah, and I just want to point out that, that Ariane Space knew the trajectory was wrong. We didn't know until a couple days after the failure that that happened. So right. there, was, there was really no way for anyone in the public to know that that had occurred. Sure, you can look at like screens of stuff and everything, but there was definitely, if you look at the, you can, you can look at screenshots of the trajectory screens in Mission Control, and it is definitely not on the correct trajectory, but you but there's not enough detail in those images to tell whether it was actually over a populated area or not. That's why we had to wait until later to find out about that. So, right. Yeah. So. All right. I think we've talked that one to death a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, although so. it's the new Zuma. <laughs> so. <laughs> Mike, what were you gonna say? Well, go ahead and get to the next comment, and you'll see what I mean. Okay. So the okay. next comment comes off of YouTube, and it's from SP. One, two, three, 
And they say that, I found it concerning how the Ariane 5 launch commentary just carried on reading out the milestones. Although I'm sure that they just show stock footage of booster and fairing separations, uh, I believed Ariane Space were a little more transparent, or at least they present themselves as such. I might have expected this of a Russian or Chinese launch, but I feel that Ariane Space have lost a considerable amount of web pass credibility over this. SpaceX have shown that sharing failure is almost or as important as sharing success. Yeah, I'll agree that I found it concerning as well, but I mean, we might not necessarily be able to blame the uh, uh, the, the webcast announcer because they were just doing their job and, and continuing things forward as they thought that they should have been. So once that that person was informed of the problem, they said so, and, and they you know stopped the, the the webcast shortly after and mm -hmm. had the whole statement by St Stefan Israel. So as soon as that person who was giving out those those uh, uh, calls um, was informed, then yeah, they they corrected themselves. But I also found that it was pretty uh, kind of concerning as well, even though the the data you know showed the things that they had lost contact with it and that they weren't getting telemetry. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to be kind of like, you don't want to mislead people, right? Like, you want to show mm -hmm. them the webcast, you want to get them excited about space, but you also don't want to feel like, you know, that you're just kind of pushing this. Everything is perfect. We're going completely nominally message when it's obvious like that you're not. So. Yeah, there's been a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of hindsight as 2020 about this whole situation as yeah. it was happening, or post after it had happened. So, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, go ahead, Mike. And all I'm just saying is let's try to give them the benefit of the doubt that yep. they weren't trying to necessarily mislead us on purpose. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Yeah, they might have been getting ratty data uh, yeah. for all we knew. So um, we don't we don't have the actual data in front of us. So I, we, I feel like I can't make a determination as to whether they were intentionally or or they just genuinely didn't actually know at that time. So because I don't when we don't know what the quality of the data is. Arion Space does, and they're probably not going to let you see that because that's how the aerospace industry works. So you don't just throw your data out there for everybody to take a look at in, uh, in most cases. So yeah, who knows? So it's well, just it's just another one that will go out into the the aether of the universe, and we'll find out probably 50 years down the road what actually happened. So. Well, fingers crossed, you know, they've got their data, they look at it, they work out what went wrong, and they, they fix it, and uh, mm -hmm. and we see Ariane launches continuing long into the future. So yeah. all the best to them, and good luck with their investigations. Yeah. Um, so our next Absolutely. comment comes off of YouTube. It's from Louise Hen, uh, or Louis Hen. This will also be the first time a private space company sends a payload beyond GTO, and they're referring to Falcon Heavy mm -hmm. here. Mm hmm yeah. Now I don't know if this Isn't is that correct because I was doing some some googling and mm -hmm. Falcon 9 launched Discover to L1, right? Yes. Which is beyond GTO. Yes, um, but I think in this case they're talking about a private company sending a private payload right. beyond GTO, um, and I actually don't think that's correct entirely um, because there were several. There, there have been several geostationary communication satellites um, that were put in the incorrect orbit, and the teams that were flying them ended up flying them around the moon in order to put them into the correct orbits. Oh, cool. Um, so I don't, I don't know if this is entirely true, but I'm not sure um, if I'm entirely correct in questioning that either. I know, I know the comments will definitely uh, correct us if, if something like that um, happens. But yeah, I, I don't know. What's well, gonna be the first one to so. send something to it near Mars? Orbit, right? Yeah, yeah I think, and flyby for sure. Yeah, th <laughs> this would this would definitely be the first uh, the first uh, private thing sent on escape velocity for yeah. sure. So yeah. So but yeah, I don't if it gets there successfully. Yeah, I don't know about GTO, but definitely a, a, a heliocentric orbit on purpose. Yes. So. <laughs> well, fingers crossed, it launches. Mm -hmm. uh, currently slated for Tuesday. So all the best to SpaceX and yeah. hopefully. Good luck. It'll go successfully, and uh, we can <laughs> make more comments on that next week. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, uh, the next comment comes off of Reddit. It's from Kubrick is my co-pilot, who says, Ultimately, the only way to improve safety is to fly. Too much emphasis on modeling means that all you're doing is building a pyramid of assumptions, which some of which evaporate the moment they make contact with reality. Mm -hmm. Ironically, it will be the organizations and institutions willing to take risks that will advance safety the quickest. Those who demand guarantees up front will 
before they will even try, will be left in the dust. Yeah, you gotta fly in order to make sure things are gonna work. So, and it's important to fly, uh, <laughs> how would I put it in flight testing? It's important to be methodical right. with your progress that you do. So, um, so something like the space shuttle with STS-1, the first flight to Columbia, we're like, we're gonna stick a crew on it and go with it. Um, I don't know if that would be a good way to go about things nowadays. Yeah. Um, you could you'd probably get away with that back then because of the, the culture that was around at that time, um, which is a fascinating thing if you ever want to study um, the, the culture of the safety of space flight, especially at NASA in the early 80s. It's, it's fantastic to understand. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's, yeah, it's it's an important point, but you, you also have to err on the side of caution yeah. because uh, if you start losing payloads, uh, you tend to also start losing customers. customers. And you also don't want to lose your customers as well, especially like your actual physical customers themselves. So, Living, breathing yeah. ones? Well, yeah. <laughs> so, space, space and ironically, Kyle. I think it's funny that you said that, that that sort of thing wouldn't happen today. The jury's still out whether or not there's going to be a crew on uh, Exploration Mission 1, the first flight of Orion and SLS together. Uh, so, as far um, as I understand, Space Mike, the, um, the cost to accelerate the safety for Exploration Mission 1 um, has pretty much ruled that out. So. At least, at the, least the cost, yes, that has definitely uh, uh, was going to be way too much, but the, it hasn't officially been decided yet, as far as I knew. I could be very wrong on that. Though, yeah, I might be wrong too. So <laughs> still, the fact wrong. that they were even considering it in today's day and age, especially since Orion has a way lower safety standard than you know even SpaceX and Boeing Starliner does, so mm -hmm. just ironic. Um, Space call in the chat says, "I'm fine as long as it explodes. Uh, I'm fine if it explodes as long as they learn something. Um, this must be in relation to Falcon Heavy, but I guess it applies to to crewed vehicles as well. As long as they learn something, I just hope it explodes after it clears the launch tower." Yeah, that so. works pretty good um, in flight testing. Not, not so much in like actual and people stuff. And yeah, like people, you tend to not want yeah, your thing to blow up. Let's not have it explode. So yeah. <laughs> All right, our next comment comes off of YouTube, and it's from Rabinda Mishra, who says, I wonder if NASA could make their deep space gateway design flexible enough that it can be assembled using Falcon Heavy. Same goes for their lunar plans. Imagine how much more can be achieved than if we had to wait for SLS to fly, which would be never. No, kidding. SLS can still be built for, <laughs> for deep space missions like Europa Clipper, um, Uranus, and Neptune orbiters, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, I, don't I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, go yeah. for it, Space Mike. I think so. I think that they, uh, the way that, and of course, the design hasn't been finalized yet, but the way that the designs are moving forward so far is definitely flexible enough that at least some of the pieces, maybe not all of the pieces, but a lot of the pieces could be launched on Falcon Heavy. But even with some of our international partners, I mean, there's some Japanese pieces that are going to be launched on H2A or the H5, whichever uh, comes online first. And even with our uh, Russian partners, they're planning on um, launching their pieces of hardware, either on Proton or on Angara 5. So uh, why not? Why not Falcon Heavy in that mix as well? We don't mm -hmm. have to launch all of our pieces with uh, SLS. The whole thing with the architecture right now is launching a piece of architecture for the Deep Space Gateway with an Orion capsule and maybe, a, you know, even like a logistics module full of cargo or something like that all in one launch. You could send just the, the, the piece of architecture itself you know, in a, a single launch on a Falcon Heavy, depending on which piece you're we're talking about. So we could go into that quite a bit and go over like all the weights requirements and stuff that exists so far. But this is still a work in progress. But mm -hmm. I don't see why why Falcon Heavy couldn't be used for a lot of it. Do you think that that if we you know allowed that the, those things that are supposed to fly on SLS to fly on Falcon Heavy? Um, should we start launching them on you know Delta Four Heavies and stuff as well? Because I guess. You don't want to kind of favor SpaceX, although they are cheaper. But like, shouldn't they? Um, shouldn't it go to all U.S. launch providers then, and not just kind of SpaceX? So we're showing it, favoritism. Stuff like that kind of depends on how far along you are in the development of your payload. Um, after the Ariane Five uh, uh, anomaly, I guess we're going to call it. Um, 
there was a huge voice that was like, switch James Webb to Falcon Heavy, switch James Webb to Falcon Heavy. And it's like, that's not how that works. You know, you, you design your payload to deal with the environment that your launcher is going to be subjecting it to, both in like your loads that you're gonna have, your acoustical th issues and things like that, the vibration environment and things like that. So it's really dependent upon where you are in the development of your vehicle, so or your payload. Um, so if you're in something like, um, if you're something like as far along as the James Webb is, where we're going to be hopefully launching it next year. Um, sorry, you know we're too far along in development. But something like um, Europa Clipper, which is being developed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory here in Pasadena, um, it's it's early on in the stages of development. It's being baselined uh, for the space launch system, but they also do have the ability um, with that mission to put it on a evolved expendable launch vehicle. Um, with that there. I don't I don't I can't recall ever seeing them talking about putting it on a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy and that's probably that probably has to do with certifications or something well beyond my my current understanding. Um, but yeah, you can't just like switch a payload because you feel like you want to switch it or because hey, you know, it's like going to two different car dealerships and saying, "You're going to give me this for this." Um, and then running to the other one and saying, "Hey, they're going to give me this for this. You want to cut it lower?" And they drop it and you run back, "Hey, you want to give me lower than what they're doing?" <laughs> it's um, like that. Yeah, 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 it's a little difficult to kind of uh, negotiate um, simply because uh, a lot of the times the design work says um, the design work that you start with is baseline for a certain launcher and that launcher has characteristics about it that are different from every other launcher, it's a wholly unique thing. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of difficult to do that. It would be so cool to have like a modular system that would allow us to plug and play on all these different rockets, depending upon what we need. But you hey, know. there's a business idea, guys. Someone go and start the payload adapter company of tomorrow. I have an idea. Um, <laughs> um, but you know what? It raises a good point. You know, if you Can't say that a used rocket let's, salesman. Let's, let's send up the Deep Space Gateway on like heavy instead of SLS, then you get this question that um, Jaded Animal from Twitch uh, says in the chat room: you, You've got to use SLS because otherwise, if you don't, people will start to ask inconvenient questions mm -hmm. like, "Why do we need SLS at all then if you can put all its payloads on Falcon Heavy?" Right? So you've got to kind of had missions put in there to go on uh, on SLS and Europa Clipper as well. Um, so the SLS has a reason to exist, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of sad. Yeah, and there might be advantages to using SLS as well so that we don't know about yet, you know, because not everything is in, in, with the upper stage that's being worked on beyond the one that they are currently looking at putting on it. I think it's called the Evolved Upper Stage Space Mike? The um, Yeah, and that one is a weird story too because they already uh, d developed the J2X engine for it. Um, but shelved it and put everything on hold with the program uh, in favor of the, the upper stages that they're going to use for, first on the SLS program. And so that's probably going to have to be completely restarted if they're even still planning on using the J2X engine for stuff that would like be heading to you know Mars or beyond. So Gotcha. Yeah. We'll see. Man, this stuff's complicated. It's space flight, right? Mm -hmm. Man. Space is complicated. I thought it was easy. <laughs> All right, um, that's our last comment. So uh, before we head off today, we want to give a very big thank you to our ground support patrons. These are the people that give us $1 per episode on Patreon or $1 per month on makersupport.com. They get their name in the show during the third segment as well as a few other rewards. So if you would like to become a crowdfunder of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com or makersupport.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, everyone, that's our show. After Dark <laughs> is up next, and, uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>